close to 10,000 pages, 33 volumes, and it took nearly 35 years to complete. Get a behind-the-scenes look at this remarkable Bible study tool and how it can help you dig deep into God's Word. That's next on Grace to You. Almost as long as Grace to You has existed, John MacArthur has been writing commentaries, helping any Christian from uh, the experienced pastor to a new believer better understand what Scripture means by what it says. Uh, Today, you're going to see how John MacArthur, using only a notepad and pen, has uh, prepared to preach every Sunday and then turned out those study notes into a series of 33 commentary volumes of the entire New Testament. And to give you a behind-the-scenes look at the special project, how it was written, and how it will benefit you and your church, John will join us in the studio with uh, Phil Johnson, the Executive Director of Grace to You. And now to begin this special conversation, here's Phil Johnson. John, it seems like you've uh, reached a number of milestones lately. And the one we want to talk about today, I'm really excited about because your life and mine are sort of tied together with the Moody Press John MacArthur New Testament Commentary Series. I first met you at the very first meeting Moody Press hosted to introduce you to potential editors to work on that series. And that was in the summer of 1981. And you just recently finished the last volume, 34 years later. (laughs) Yeah, um, it, it, it went by really fast. And yet at the same time, it seemed like an interminable thing to produce 33 Volumes. I think the average volume is somewhere between 350 and 400 pages. Yeah, th- that was the first time I met you. Um, and in- the irony is uh, I- I've worked with you ever since. Yeah, um, and the idea was that I was going to preach through the New Testament, and then there would be a group of editors who would uh, take my sermon transcript after it was preached that would be recorded and then turned to transcript, and they would kind of clean it up and paragraph it and edit it and kick it back to me to work on. And it, you know, we kind of tried that a very brief time. And I realized this was never going to work because you, you, too many chefs spoil the broth. Yeah. You plus know? 12 editors feeding you stuff from uh, all kinds of angles. You and couldn't all keep up with, with a it. Kind of a different treatment of things. Right. And maybe different, you know, processes. So it quickly became obvious that I, I was going to have to narrow this thing down to one person who would just be true to me. So for the last, well, as you say, 35 years, there has really rarely ever been a week that I wasn't editing those manuscripts. So I would preach sermons. They would be taped then or recorded. Then somebody would type them up. The same lady, Arlene Hampton, typed those manuscripts for almost that whole time, and she's now with the Lord. Yeah. She knew what I taught maybe, maybe better than anybody on the planet because she personally listened in her ears and typed and then I would get a a manuscript from her and then it would go to an editor because in preaching there's repeats and redundancies and there's no punctuation there's no paragraphs so I started out with a guy named Dave Douglas and for years he would clean it up paragraph it quadruple space it and then send it back to me and I would then use that to write the commentary Uh, I'd have I'd have to add a lot because Preaching doesn't cover everything, but what what was really helpful with the editing was cleaning it up and then doing one other thing, fact-checking, that if I quoted a verse, I got the reference right, it was quoted correctly. If I quoted some other source, that that quote was right, it was from the right book or the right source. Uh, so for 35 years, I've had manuscripts in my hands up until just a few months ago doing that process. Then I would kick it back to that same editor who would input pages and pages and pages of my corrections. And once that was all inputted, I would see maybe a final galley proof on it, and we'd be just to be sure there wasn't anything missed. Yeah, for all the years I've known you, you have been working on commentary chapters every week of that time. What are you going to do now with all that spare time? I'm not going to do the Old Testament. <laughs> everybody I, asks. I, everybody says, are you going to do the Old Testament? I, some lady said that to me, and I said, are you looking at me, ma'am? 
Okay. Are you looking at me? Or just look at my face and ask yourself whether if it took me 35 years to do the New Testament and there are more books in the Old Testament and they're a whole lot longer. <laughs> there are so, many of us praying that the Lord will give you that many years. But <laughs> Well, I'm taking a stab at one chapter in the Old Testament, and uh, I'm not sure when it will be available, but but um, maybe within the next year, there will be a commentary on Isaiah 53. I, I preach through Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. I think I took 10 sermons, and those were turned into manuscripts. And Dave Enos, uh, who did the, the, the latter of the commentaries, Dave Douglas did the first batch, and then Dave Enos was my editor on the final. He's He's editing those sermons and kicking them back to me on Isaiah 53. So the process is still going on. Yeah, those two editors did most of the commentaries. There were a couple of other editors uh, who, who we really ought to credit, Nate Busnitz and Gary Newsman. Was anybody else involved? Not really. Uh, Nathan, who teaches at the Master Seminary and is part of our pastoral team at Grace Church, and Gary Newsman, who was an editor here at Grace to You, gave some additional help as we needed it, you know, being an extra reader and clarifying. And when we started getting toward the finish and they started piling up, Nathan was really helpful because Nathan did some of the work taking it from the rough manuscript and cleaning it up so I could edit it. Now, you gave a sort of brief overview of the process to get the material from the editor and get it back to him and all of that. But actually, your work on these starts with your sermon preparation. In fact, the process you go through is fascinating. I think you should describe that because most people probably don't envision what are you doing there in your study, are you just reading, and do you do you memorize what you want to use? Tell us the process you go through. Well, it sort of ends up being memorized, not by a conscious effort to memorize it, but by spending so many hours in a week in a, in a short, abbreviated passage of Scripture, I pretty much get it in my mind. But the idea for me is to know the text, to go back to the original text in the New Testament, the Greek. And I had a minor in Greek in college. I had 24 units of Greek in college. And then I took more Greek in seminary because I knew I wanted to work in the New Testament. Not that I'm a Greek expert, but I had enough that I could work with it. And so I would, I have a eight and a half uh, by 11 sort of a legal pad of paper. And I, I write down every verse on one sheet and I just start putting down what I'm drawing out of the original text, and then I go through reading commentaries. I, I would read anywhere from a dozen to 20 commentaries, uh, anybody who might say anything helpful, and what I'm looking for is interpretations, uh, theological insights, uh, historical backgrounds, cross-references, and I just take copious notes of all those things that I'm in that discovery process. And Good. His love toward Israel endures forever. So they were singing, I am good, you are loved. I am good, you are loved. And all the people, y'all get ready to act out the text, gave a great shout. That's a medium shout. Wasn't a bad shout, but it wasn't a great shout. All the people gave a great shout. I want to see which campus can shout the loudest. Make a video of your campus and send it to me real quick. All the people gave a great shout. A great shout. A, not a baby shout. No, no, no. That's a great shout. Ah! A great shout. Shout. Look at the foundation. This is amazing. We're going to have a temple again. We're going to have a temple again. We're going to have a temple again. Touch three people and tell them we're going to have a temple again. Touch 12 people, tell them we're going to have a temple again. Touch 24 people, tell them we're going to have a temple again. Oh, I heard about the temple. I always wish I could have a temple. My, my granddad would tell me about the temple. He told me about the incense. He told me about the bowls. He told me about the prayer. He told me about the holy of holies. He told me about the sacrifice. He told me about the atonement. He told me about the mercy. He told me about the presence. He told me about the glory. He told me about the inner sanctuary. He told me about the burden. We're going to have a temple. We're going to have a temple. We're getting a temple. We're getting a temple. So they, they start blowing trumpets. They start playing at 808s. They start having a party and praising God over the progress. You have to learn to praise God over progress, not just product. You have to learn 
to pr- that's what gives you momentum that's what gives you momentum you have to praise God for 10 yards not just touchdowns you have to praise God for every trimester you have to praise God you have to do it or you'll get distracted and discouraged like the Levites because while one generation is praising God oh we're gonna have a temple y'all it's gonna be amazing I can't wait to get in this temple and praise God oh this is gonna be incredible and here come the people who should be leading the praise party and while the young people are blowing trumpets you got trumpet sound or anything like that get one ready and we just do it real quick it says verse 12 many of the older priests and levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others But here's the problem, 13. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because it all just started sounding like noise. Has it been noisy in your heart lately? You can't tell the difference of whose voice is this. Is this God or is this the devil? Or is it just my Twitter feed? Is this God? Is this the devil? Or is it just me? Is this faith or is this foolishness? How could a group of people from the same nation be standing at the same foundation and one of them pulling out trumpets and one of them in tears? Trumpets and tears. Trumpets and tears. Both at the same time. Trumpets and tears. She's shouting, Come on now. He's sleeping in the same sermon. Trumpets and tears. Celebration, devastation. Expectation, disappointment. Looking at the same thing. One voice is saying, This is amazing. One voice is saying, And like the old one. The old one was better. I mean, we had Solomon's temple, and Solomon's temple, it was so good. It was so much good. Gold in Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was missing, gonna be like it was. And I used to have so much more. And at some point, the disappointment starts drowning out the faith. Has that been happening in your temple? In your temple? Where there's something to celebrate. Oh, by the way, the second R that I want to talk about, because I did remnant last week, and apparently I'm only going to do one this week, <laughs> is reference. There is a point of reference that you could come to today in your temple. Now, remember, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about temples and Solomon's temple, this temple, by the way, it is eventually. Everybody say eventually. Put it in the chat if you know how to spell it. Eventually. It's eventually going to be between two and three times bigger than the one that they're weeping over. But right now, it seems like nothing. You have to be strong in seasons where it seems like nothing or it will always be what it is right now 
And I don't know who needs this medicine, but wishing won't get the temple built. Wanting won't get the temple built. Waiting won't get the temple built. Well, the Bible says, wait on the Lord. I know. I wrote a song about it. I believe that Bible verse too. But when waiting on what God is going to do or wishing for what God used to do replaces working with what God gave you right now. I mean, right now, be strong. Right now, man up. Right now, square up with your enemies and say, it's not going to be what it was. It's going to be better. I feel like preaching. I feel like preaching. So the builders lay the foundation and there's trumpets and the builders lay with the content. And so nobody has a book of manuscripts of Jesus preaching. We have a book full of Jesus doing. Okay. But Jesus preaching became the gateway for what Jesus was doing. So preaching is not the destination. It's the transportation to the doing. It's not just about being good at saying something and going out the back door and going home. The preaching is the gateway to doing, and the word was made flesh. So then the message is communicated only when there is mobilization. Is that what you're saying? Only when there's mobilization on greater shield, only when there's transformation. Mm. Uh, only when fellowship is in, in, involved. I would have loved to, to sit around the table and listen to Jesus talk because every preacher is better around the table than they are on the stage. And, and just to, just to be, I just preached Sunday uh, about Jesus' supper being ended. Jesus laid aside his garments. He washed the disciples' feet. And and, and, and and the one text that talks about one of you is a devil. And, and, and then they, once they resolve that, they begin to wrestle with, uh, who, who are you going to leave in power? And Jesus challenges them to humility to humble themselves. They just say, it's amazing to me. I just got through washing your feet and you're still crazed with power. It's, it's such a picture of where we are today. We want the power. We want the stage. We want the platform. We don't want to do the work. Do the work. Greatness is expensive. Do the work. And he says, the greatest amongst you is the one who serves. So if your message doesn't serve a higher purpose than yourself, then you're never going to be successful. It has to be where you're trying to move something in me, move something in the world. I didn't write this book to sell books. I don't have time to do interviews and sell books. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say something to the world. Black people need to talk to white people. White people need to talk to black people. Stop telling me what it's like to be me and listen. And I'll stop telling you what it's like to be you and listen. And we need to talk to people that we don't agree with. We need to go back to sitting. We When we were talking across the fence to our neighbors and with our clothes hanging on the, on, on the clothes hangers, we were neighbors. Uh, now... We're throwing tweets behind nameless uh, memes and blacked out faces, and we're becoming enemies. But when you had to own your comments, you monitored your words like you tell your children to do. And we did better than we are now hurling insults in anonymity. And uh, I'm trying to get us to communicate again, to talk again, to not allow our differences to make us hate each other. I'm not trying to change your view, but I'm saying to hate me because I think differently is not a good reason to hate me.
not to the point of shooting me and bombing me and burning up my house or shooting me on the sidewalk or acting like I don't matter or or destroying me or gang violence or any uh, some somebody interviewed me the other day and said well, they they thought they had me and, and they asked me something about gang violence as opposed to police brutality i said there's no difference between the salty tears that fall down the face of a mother whose son died to a gang shooting and the salty tears of a mother whose son was tried on the sidewalk by a police officer who overreacted in the moment. Dead is still dead. There is no good dead and bad dead. Now we have to argue about which dead we ought to be talking about. We're, we're having the most ignorant conversation. Black lives matter. No, all lives matter. Well, if all lives matter, then doesn't that mean black lives matter? <laughs> you know, these are the kinds of things that we get hung up on that keep us away from truth. Yes, uh, semantics rather than policies. And uh, I'm just, this is my little attempt to say, let's talk. I got on the phone with some of the some of the well-known uh, white pastors who spoke out during Black Lives Matter and got attacked. And I got on the phone and they said things that I didn't like and our community didn't like. I got on the phone, called them and said, keep talking. You'll get it right if you keep talking. What advice would you give me? I said, don't start talking on social media before you talk to people you know around dinner tables in your life. Don't use the national platform as a litmus test of appropriateness. Wow. And the reason you didn't get it right is because you don't live amongst the people you're talking about. You got us decorated on your stage. We're Ooh. flowers and stuff. We're ornaments. But you, you've never been to my house for dinner. You don't know how I feel about my kids. I'm not invited into your inner circle. Start there. And try your ideas out on people who love you enough to overlook your callousness. <clears throat> and then when you release a statement, pass it through enough people that it has that it has more scrutiny than your worldview. Because you're not talking to you or people who were raised like you, you're talking to the world. I have said dumb stuff. And I have, I have, I have, I have said, I, I have said something uh, to the, uh, about Kenyans in passing. Uh, I've referred to digging wells in, in the indigenous area of Kenyans, and I used the wrong term for indigenous. And and they, I didn't even know some of the cuss words they said. <laughs> I thought, how do you spell that? <laughs> okay. But I immediately got upset. I'm, that's not what I meant. I am absolutely wrong, absolutely sorry. That is not my heart about the matter. And I backed out of it and I learned from it. Yes, sir. You nobody gets it right. We got but but I didn't stop talking and I didn't stop loving and I didn't stop reaching out and I didn't stop caring and, and they forgave me. Like like my wife forgave me, like my kids forgave me, like I forgive them. Don't drop the mic. Have you ever watched The Exorcist and wondered, are demons real? Well, we interviewed a leading exorcist to find out, and the truth was shocking. Tell me who you are. The one you won't get out. The one you can't. Levitations, vomiting, spitting at the priest with an uncanny marksmanship. Well, that has not been a movie for me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Paper Ghosts is a true crime podcast investigating the mysterious disappearance and brutal, unsolved murder of Tammy Zawicki. They just kept telling us from the beginning, she'll, she'll be back, she'll be back. We had no clue where she was. Didn't know where to begin looking. Tammy's story shocked the nation. The deeper I searched, the more troubling things I found. The best lead 
the best evidence, the best witness, was blown off. Listen to Paper Ghosts on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. I'm Jason Alexander. And I'm Peter Coburn. And we know you've been pining for a brand new podcast hosted by a beloved television icon. And a largely unknown talk radio host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote that. Pine no more, because we're the hosts of Really No Really, the funny, informative show that seeks the answers to things that make us say, really? No, really? You laugh, you learn. And we'll get paid. That's Really No Really with Jason Alexander and Peter Tilden on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, or where you get your podcasts. And anybody who uses the word pining, let me know, because... I don't think it's very common since the Middle Ages. Very common word. All right, so today is Valentine's Day, and Americans in a relationship will be spending an average of $187 on their significant other this Valentine's Day, and that is down 10% from last year's average of $208. Couples who've been together longer tend to spend less than those in new relationships, Junior. So... This is a question for the guys. Does your spouse tell you what they want or do you surprise them? Steve, you're very, very romantic. Everyone knows that. So please give us a few suggestions on how to do Valentine's Day on a budget, if you will. Oh. (laughs) Inflation and all that. Quite a bit of hesitancy. (laughs) Well, uh, give, give me the budget you want me to work with. Okay. Well, do the do today's average. They say people are spending one hundred and eighty-seven dollars. Two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. Two hundred. Yeah, we'll round it yeah. up. Good, Tommy. Mm-hmm. We'll round it up to two hundred dollars. A spa package. I don't know how much that costs, but I think okay. it's more. That's two hundred. That's, That's two hundred. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you know, well, well we're it. not gonna do the whole package then. We just gonna do spa. <laughs> you can add it to get your feet done. Yeah. <laughs> Cupid, you're just gonna, gonna be Cupid do SP. right now. <laughs> You're not going to get the A. It's just $200 damn dollars now. You know, $200, of course, everybody naturally going to go candy and flowers. But I think mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you put a little bit more thought into it, I think uh, if, fellas, if you did something like you, even if you can't cook, even if you bought dinner home tonight, you bought it mm-hmm. home. You know, from a restaurant, get takeout, take it in there and plate it real nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, go on the internet and see how food look on plates and set your plate up the same way. Uh-huh. <laughs> Make sure you take a wet napkin and wipe all the drip marks out of yes. where you took mm-hmm. it out the box. Because mm-hmm. I've learned that from watching chefs. When you put food on the plate, wipe around the area that don't have food on it so it looks like each individual item is set there neat. Mm. You know, okay. then uh, present dinner to her tonight. That can be under two hundred dollars, and you set the table, buy some candles on the way in, and sit across from him and have a dinner. I think that's extra. You know, okay. uh, if you really trying to make brownie points, you got to do something a public PDA, public mm. display of affection, it has to be mm. in front of all the women. So the women's men, so the women's men who did not do anything feel shame, and your girl get to stick her uh, chest out like a peacock at the office. Uh-huh. Anything mm-hmm. you can do down at the office, singing telegrams, mm-hmm. uh, video presentations, mm-hmm. anything you could do outside the office in front of her girls where they can all see it. Anything you can get sent up to the office in front of people. Mm-hmm. Always goes over really, really well. Okay. Uh, yeah. your two hundred dollars that ain't purse money. Get that out your head. <laughs> Can't get a handbag. Uh, Can't get a no, bag. You're not, you're not gonna get the purse she want with your two hundred. Uh, get up off of that. And so you know, just be creative like that. Uh, okay, that's good, Steve. I like that. That's good. Mm-hmm. Very creative. Yeah. Okay, what if you got, let's, five hundred dollars. Five hundred. Five hundred. In a minute. Or you can do the dinner at the house. You can do flowers at the job. Mm -hmm. Dinner at the house, flowers at the job. Run her bath water. Let her Mm -hmm. bathe. You towel pat her dry. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you want a a different type of candy bought in. You want go to Godiva chocolate and get them chocolate-covered strawberries. Women love that. And then have the champagne with it and have Mm -hmm. on the side of the champagne... 
a little cup with confectionery white powdered sugar in it. And that's what what's that for? <laughs> that's for when you take your finger and dip it in the champagne <laughs> and put it on her and then dip that okay. same wet finger in the powdered sugar and put it on her. And then All you don't right. take it off I with your hand. <laughs> take off that powder sugar with your mouth. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, day. Yeah. to you. <laughs> 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 All right, coming up next, it is the prank phone call for today from the nephew right after this. You're listening to the Steve Harvey Morning Show. Paper Ghosts is a true crime podcast investigating the mysterious disappearance and brutal, unsolved murder of Tammy Zawicki. They just kept telling us from the beginning, she'll, she'll be back, she'll be back. We had no clue where she was. Didn't know where to begin looking. Tammy's story shocked the nation. The deeper I searched, the more troubling things I found. The best lead, the best evidence, the best witness was blown off. Listen to Paper Ghosts on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. Have you ever watched The Exorcist and wondered, are demons real? Well, we interviewed a leading exorcist to find out, and the truth was shocking. Tell me who you are. The one you won't get out. The one you can't. Levitations, vomiting, spitting at the priest with an uncanny marksmanship. That has not been a movie for me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jason Alexander. And I'm Peter Coleman. And we know you've been pining for a brand new podcast hosted by a beloved television icon. And a largely unknown talk radio host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote that. Pine no more, because we're the hosts of Really No Really, the funny, informative show that seeks the answers to things that make us say, really? No, really? Um... It's, I think it's fair to say that my career was, was in a better position and I brought more financially to the, to the place, uh, to the start of the marriage. But, but the notion that she nearly won on that as well uh, just would have been devastating. I don't know if I'd, if I'd be here speaking with you if, if I'd lost on that, uh, on that point. But it, Why that one particularly? Because because the accumulated, well, I've been buying and selling properties since I was 17 and started out as an actor in London. So the wealth that I'd accumulated was in the house, um, you mm. know, it's an expensive house. And so the sale of that house didn't really need, there wasn't very much of a tiny mortgage left on it. So that was really the, I put everything into that house because I'm, I'm old see, school. I, I believe, you know, you own, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to owe money to people. In America, I did I, this whole credit system of, you know, you have to get credit, you have to get credit where I come from. It's like, no, you just, if you want something, you buy it and you own it. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what I, I wanted see. to so have you'd put your, I see. So you put all the eggs in that particular basket. And so, yeah. and that wasn't taken away from you completely. Not, not Why completely. Not? Why not? Uh, because, um, well, the title was the title to the house was in my name and her name, and as much as she presented in court that it was her house and I wasn't on title, that piece of evidence um, was pretty crystal clear. Um, she couldn't steal that. And was yeah. that was that part of the basis for your ability to rebuild your your security? Let's say. Yes. Yes. I mean, I was homeless for a while. I was homeless for a good few months. Um, but yeah, so for the kindness I'm... of a few friends who gave me sofas and floors to sleep on. and uh, why, why did they do in. that? Why, did, why do you think they trusted you, given everything that had collapsed around you and all the calumny that had been heaped on your name? And why those particular people, do you think? Well, it's a, that's, a, that's an insightful question. That just makes me... I, I, I look to what are the commonalities between those individuals. They were all men. Uh, there was one woman, um, so not all men, most of them men, and they'd all been through divorces. I see, I um, see. So, okay, so, so, so they had but some they knew sense. The character, they, 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 knew, they knew, like there was one, one gentleman, I mentioned him in the book, Adam Fogelson, who was the chairman of Universal Studios. He was, he was, he knew who I was. He, I, I, uh, my, his young, his eldest daughter and my, my son were in pre-kindergarten together. I taught his daughter how to sing and play piano and songwrite. And mm. so he knew that he knew that even though 
I was public enemy number one on the streets and I was being vilified. He didn't believe it. He, his integrity was so strong that when the second time, when I, when I finally got released or discharged, he had actually employed a security team, um, top-notch security team to tr track the police scanners because they knew I, he knew I was going to come up for air. And of course, I did at the neighbor's house. And then the, that was when there was a team of, I think, 10 police. This was the second time, five days later, where they you just banged on the door and I opened the door and they dragged me out and handcuffed me again. And I got dressed down by the sergeant. And this, this gentleman just kind of stepped out from the shadows and had a word with the sergeant and, and kind of I got, I got unhandcuffed and I walked into what I thought, Jordan, I thought it was homelessness. And, and he said, come with me, someone's been looking out for you. And he, took, he walked me to Adam, Fogels, Adam and Hillary Fogelson's house. Uh -huh, and, uh -huh. um, and So they, you did and have they, some relationships there that withstood the test of time. You can imagine yeah. what would happen if you lost that too, man. So I had this client, yeah. his wife just... He was a good guy, hyper conscientious, professional. And uh, his wife just, she, she nailed him with accusations of abuse. And she was very attractive and charming and very manipulative and malevolent. And white knights were riding to her aid all the time. And he mm. wanted to uh, get 50-50 custody of his kids. And she, she, first of all, with the allegations of abuse, destroyed his professional reputation. So that means he lost all his clients in his profession. And then she accused him of hiding the money because he was having a hard time making alimony payments because he did, couldn't make any money because his profession had been ruined. And so then he set himself up again, providing health care to basically indigenous people on social services. And then he made a go of that. And then she accused him again in court of having money that he was drawing on. So they froze his bank accounts and and, uh, and and garnished his wages. And so that made it very difficult for anybody mm. to hire him. And then they could take away, he, he had to drive to work because he could no longer work close to where he lived. And then they took away his driver's license because they can do that without court in Canada. And so then he couldn't drive. And then they took away his passport because they could do that too. And so in the meantime, to take him through court to siphon the last penny out of him and deny him access to his children. And I went out with him and his children several times. And they were all, let's see, two, three, and five, I think, three boys. We went out to the science museum, which is a challenging thing to do with three young kids. And he showed yeah. up on time on the van and he walked those kids through that science museum and they just had a wonderful time. And I watched him like a hawk and he was a really good father. And uh, she, pursuing him, her father mortgaged their house and she spent all their money, at which they deserved very nicely because they had raised her to be just exactly the way she was. And it was just a bloody disaster. disaster I worked with him right? for like three years trying to help him negotiate through this without dying, you know, yes, just because yes. he wanted his kids. And I pulled out every stop to strategize and we were careful and he did what we negotiated and and he was really dedicated to his kids and he just got ground up, yes. man. And then and all this stuff blew up around me and around that, about that's, that time. That's, and that's I that story, what you him. talk about right there. I think I think you I think I heard you mention that maybe a few years ago, that particular story. It may have been that one when you were when you were in practice, but um that speaks to there is no escape. It's the zero sum game of of family law. And it is a game mm -hmm. to these attorneys. And it's not just no escape for me. Uh, as a respondent, it's no escape for the petitioner too, like with yeah, Johnny right. Depp and his situation, right? So, you know, the false allegation of domestic violence, it's, it's, we, we need to remind people Johnny Depp has not been found, not only not been found guilty of any crime, he's not been accused of any crime. Um, he's been tried and, and found guilty in the court of public opinion, guilty till proven more guilty. And I think it's that, it's those kinds of, um, you know, th that in inability to escape the divorce trap. There's no trap door. There's no way out for both parties. Um, and, you know, my, my ex-wife spent 1.8, I, I believe it's $1.8 million on an, on an attorney, her attorney, yeah. Judy Bogan. Um, and then after four years, this attorney just filed to the court to be released from the case. And I believe is now suing my ex-wife for $450,000 on top of that. So the, the blatant plundering of an estate 
um, and how someone you've you've worked your whole life, you've you've you know started from not a lot, and you've revealing himself to people who are familiar with kind of like uh, Wild West justice. He's revealing himself to a people who have a sense of what's right and what's wrong, but don't necessarily know how to pursue what's right and what's wrong in a way that is absolutely just and absolutely fair. I mean, consider this. In the ancient Egypt and in the ancient Mediterranean, as well as in the Greco-Roman world, what you have is you have the gods and goddesses, and these gods and goddesses are not good. They're not just. They're not fair. And so what you have is power. Power is what rules. What you have is usefulness, utility. Utility is what rules. And here is God who's saying to these people, he's teaching them a new way to be. What he's teaching them is not only a new way to be, he's also teaching them his identity. And his identity is, oh no, I am a God of justice. I am a God who does hear the cry of the poor. I am a God who your actions matter to me. And not only do they matter, but your actions cannot be rooted merely in power or merely in vengeance or merely in usefulness, but your actions must be rooted in justice. And so what we have is God beginning to give these commandments of behavior, of here, here is how you live in this society, and it's based off of justice first. He's speaking to a community that does not know him and a community that does not necessarily know that there are restrictions on what you can do to other people. Here's what I mean, is you have the kind of slave labor that those Israelites themselves, those Hebrews themselves, lived under and suffered under for 400 years under the Egyptians. So slavery in that context is completely normal. In fact, it's one of the ways in which, and this is, uh, please forgive me for saying this, but it's one of the ways in which people cared for each other. Here is someone who is, I am, I am completely uh, homeless. I am jobless. I have no prospects. I have nothing to sell. I have nothing to, to offer, but I can offer myself. I can sell my services. And so one of the things you have is a difference between what you might call chattel slavery and this slavery that, again, it's not like I've heard other people say, oh, I mean the good kind of slavery. Well, <laughs> not good kind of slavery, but also not the same that we are familiar with in, um, the Far East and not the same kind of slavery we're familiar with in Europe and not the same kind of slavery we're familiar with in North America, but a kind that said, I might take it upon myself with no other options to place myself in what you might call indentured servitude to someone who can care for me when I'm serving them. Again, it's not ideal, but that's the whole point is God has to start somewhere. This is a people that does not know the Lord God and his justice. These are the people that, that do not necessarily remember that in the beginning, God made them male and female. He made them in his image and likeness. This is the people that have to be taught what justice is. They have to be taught what fairness is. They have to be taught what it is to treat another human being, again, with justice. And so this is, this is like lesson one. So keep this in mind because we're going to continue in the next couple of days to go through some more laws. And these laws might be challenging to us and our sensibilities, but it's kind of like this is the last little thing. If um, you were taking trigonometry or you're taking calculus in high school or college and you looked at your little brother or little sister's homework in first or second grade, you wouldn't look at their addition and subtraction. You wouldn't look at, at their multiplication or division and say, well, that's silly. Why are you spending all this time with one plus one or two minus th three minus two? That's math is can get so much more advanced than this. Well, students have to start somewhere. You have to start at the lowest possible level. Even just here's what a number is. Let's start counting. <laughs> and so that's what God is doing right here. He is starting at the lowest possible level that this people are able to to accept and begin living. He's going to call them higher, but he first has to come down to their level. He's teaching at level one and he's calling them up ultimately to the highest levels, to the level where we say, okay, we're not gonna violate justice, but we're choosing mercy over justice, but they have to first know what justice is. He's gonna ultimately get them to the point where they're no, absolutely clear and a human being, a human person is made in God's image and likeness and must always be treated this way. But he has to first say, I'm going to begin doing this by putting some parameters on what you can do to each other. And so here are some rules. If there is someone who is a slave, then you, there are some parameters. You can't do anything you want with them. They are not truly your property, but they are a human being 
who's in your employ, essentially, at your service. Same kind of thing when it comes to uh, if you hurt someone else, it's an eye for an eye, not a, uh, a life for an eye. Hope that makes sense because this is just the beginning. We're going to get the rest of God's lesson one in how to live with other people and how to live in justice as the days continue. Let's keep praying for each other because especially when we hit some more challenging portions and maybe I don't even explain it as best as you want me to explain it. I Reach out to me. Maybe I can do a better job later on. But we're keep praying for each other because we are not, this is not just a one day thing. This is a 365 day thing. We're going to keep walking with each other, keep journeying with each other and keep praying for each other. My name is Father Mike. I cannot wait to see you tomorrow. God bless. Yes. And people did not anticipate. So larger homes. Look at uh, neighborhoods now. Look at political tribalism, which is growing unbelievable today in America, right? Red zone, blue zone. These are now mega brands. And people are self-sorting across America into these things. This is what's Before you go further, I want you to go help the X generation in this room understand the millennials here. Because, because the X generation was underprotected, and again, I was that stage, it was 1960, but that's, I have the memories somewhere in my psyche, probably because it was recapped every year in those days, of Kennedy and the optimism of that time, because I was three years old when it was happening, but I was raised by myself. I had to raise myself, I had to figure it out. So I had this optimism, but the pragmatism. But the way you raise your children usually as a whole is different because since you were underprotected, that became baby on board. If you looked at movies in the 70s, Babies were very different. They were like evil little bastards. Like it was Rosemary's baby, right? That's absolutely it was right. the omen. Yeah. It was, you know, somebody's head twirling around the exorcist. And suddenly it's three men and a baby, baby on board. Talk a little bit about that transition. Well, why, that, why, that, why millennials are the way they are? Because they've done nothing wrong. They've just been raised differently. The golden age of child as devil horror movies really lasted from about 1965 <laughs> to about 1982. So exactly when Xers were small kids. I mean, that was the most negative image of small kids in American history. There were no G-rated movies. There, were, there was not even, you, know, you had to drive 500 miles just to find Benji. <laughs> but my point was, so that was, that was what was going on. And um, uh, the phrase, you can do an engram search if you want. But the phrase, uh, children are special, mm. was literally no mention going all the way up through the late 60s, 1970, until about 1977, 78. No one ever wrote that phrase in a published work. So suddenly it began rising. And after 1982 or three with millennials, it just goes into the stratosphere, right? So suddenly millennials are surrounding these cuddly baby movies and these signs of a baby on board and minivans with 12 different ways to buckle the precious kids into their seats. Back when extras are small, you just told kids to do this. That was good enough. But so all of this has, see, all of this has changed. But this shapes generations yes. permanently. Here's the thing. Archaeologists know this. You can take a tree, you can cut the tree down, and you can look at the rings on a tree and look at the widths of the rings on a tree. And you can tell when that tree had, you know, a really lush spring and summer, a lot of water, a little thin ring. That's when it went through the drought. We are all like that. We are all like trees. And very often, if you're a certain age, you know, by the way, any tree you cut down all has the same kind of rings, right? They all have the same ring pattern because they all went through the same thing. So it's the same thing. Generations are like trees in that respect. And we all internalize. We have a record inside ourselves of when you went through these different seasons. Yes. But the big challenge is, again, I want to come back to this because this is a challenge of the crisis. You look around the world today. By the way, this isn't just America. Why is the whole world moving away from sort of individualistic, liberal democracy where everyone's individual rights are protected. The whole world is moving toward populism, moving toward guarantees for the group. You talk to millennials, they want security. They want community. They don't want that rugged individualism that a lot of Xers, you know, recall, right? It's, it's a shift in perspective. 
And they so were also raised, you know, there's a there's a great book called The Coddling of America that if you haven't read it, you yeah. should also read yeah. by Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt, Haidt yeah. yeah Haidt, exactly. and, Haidt, and he's he goes through and shows that it started with babies at that stage not only being taught you got to be safe every moment. Safety wasn't a question before, right? But now everything is about your safety and your security. And on the milk cans or the milk bottles that most people did for their cereal every morning was a child that was missing. They started that during that time. And they never told you the kids were found or that it was stolen by the father who was, you know, just got the divorce. They never, so all that was is constant fear and uncertainty. And then the constant peace, it magnified that when we got to the point of social media when around 19, you know, or 2010, all of a sudden everybody's got an iPhone and now there's a different world where constantly they're being reinforced to be a certain way. Right? So it creates a radically different culture. But, but I want to plant a seed for the millennials right now so you hear it. The millennials are our next heroes. They will, when we hit this next crisis, just like the flappers, the ones we talked about, can great generation. I have great excitement for the millennials because they have a different level of relationship to technology, of networking. I'd like to make sure we talk about that. They're really going to be an important part of the solution. But they also have a different relationship with each other. True. And that's the point. And that's how they differ from Xers. Millennials really get it. They believe in doing everything as a community. And they believe that people need a simple set of rules, prescriptions. Let's just follow the same rules. That way we avoid any of these problems. Let's just get everyone on the same page. And by the way, if a certain group of people refuses to be on the same page, and I, I was going to talk about this eventually, conflict. Yes. Let's have it out. That's right. Because it has to happen, it's going to happen. Because if Every they see it as immoral or wrong, if you have a different point of right. view, there's something wrong with you. It's not we have different points of view. My view is the way. Your point of view shouldn't be. There shouldn't be free speech. Who in their lifetime thought we'd be hearing that from liberals? But We're all is, about free speech. But this is going on around the world. You yes. look at, you know, I don't care whether you're in, everywhere around the, you, Xi Jinping in China, Narendra Modi in India. You go look at uh, Abe Shinzo and sort of the transformation in Japan. But you look, you look increasingly at Europe. You know, Le Pen, unbelievably, she's probably one election away from winning in France. But my point is, all of these societies are becoming more populist around a kind of cultural, social center gravity in the nation. No one really cares so much about the marginalized groups anymore. Everyone is focusing on the majoritarian center. Let's get the rules right for them so at least basic things work again. That's happening all around. And we sometimes think oh, it's just America that has this problem. It's not. This is this this generational pattern now increasingly involves much of the world. And they want the ones who were raised that way, the older millennials are now around forty years old. So they're the ones writing for the Washington Post and for the New York Times. They're the ones that are on television doing that. So they're entering positions of power and influence and they're bringing the value systems that they've learned and grown up with to the world and expecting the rest of the world to be that way. And by the way, just to point out you saw the same thing happen during the 1920s. So you're right about the 1990s. While Xers were out enjoying, you know, grunge and Nirvana and thrash metal and just doing all that stuff, you know, it was, it was totally transgressive and, the, you know, the damaged font advertisements and everything that was so Xer, right? Um, Millennials were watching, you know, Barney and his friends and, you know, Blue's Clues. And, and they were going to this, this huge renaissance of Disney, you know, uh, movies, you know, like Lion King and all that. So they were enjoying this very protected color. I, I, I get it. I understand it, but, but I don't think that it's proper or biblical right. or honoring to God to take that problem and begin to now throw it on top of the church and start swinging your sword and, and destroying brothers and sisters. Well, swinging swords is, is what the internet was designed I'm for. I'm sympathetic <laughs> to the problem that they're having. Right. But I don't, I don't um, want to promote, well, I understand you feel that way, so go ahead and start taking heads. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's a, if you want to discuss it, then let's get to the text of Scripture. Let's look at how the Bible talks about alcohol. Let's look at how it talks about these things. And let's, let's see what the Word of God says, not what our traditions say, not with what we're socially comfortable with. Let's make sure we let the Word of God speak. Gotcha. So. And I think that's at play here. Someone we like. Okay, this is about me. And it's about you and me. This is why I'm so blind to you. Oh. Okay. Uh, you have, uh, evidently you've cast a spell or something on me. It must be the beard. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. 
Um, look, I would honestly love to spend a whole lot more time with you. Yeah. But we are both very busy guys. Yes. And other than Reform Con and the Christmas party at your house, I don't think we've seen each other since the last time you were on. We did the Coogee thing. Coogee thing with, well. Wasn't that before Christmas? Yeah, it was before Christmas. Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe, maybe you're right. Yeah. And then I came by your house for the for the Christmas party. Yeah, yeah. And then we did Reform Con. Yeah. And that's pretty much I think it. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It, I think it's you're right. uh, we will we'll Facebook message. Mm-hmm. I I would like to think you'd like to spend more time with me. Would love to. But we're too busy. We both have incredibly busy lives, and right. so it's not like we're just getting to hang out all the time. It, yeah. It, uh, so. And let me just can I maybe address this for a second? Yeah. The. Um, how I view the local church, um, governed by elders, ruling elders, and uh, that are teachers, pastors, and while I believe that each local, I'm, you know, I'm a Reformed Baptist fundamentally in my thinking about how the, the church operates, while I believe you have this church that's essentially independent, right, governed by these elders, I, I still have deep convictions about the fact that John Sampson mm. or Rich Pierce can speak into my life and call me and say, brother, I think something's wrong and I want to talk to you about it and I want you to listen to me. I think that you still have the right and responsibility to correct me if I'm in error. And I can tell you that Pastor Luke and I both uh, are committed to being challenged and confronted if ever our conduct is not in step with the gospel or with the the glory of Jesus Christ. So and while we have I, people on the inside that might let us know. Too. That's right, that's right. So so I specifically Clementine. So everybody should know that our view at Apologia Church of church government is not isolationism and I'm Moses right, running the red the right. people through the Red Sea. Um, you just defended the entire Calvary Chapel movement. Yeah, that's just, right. I'm not sure you can uh, I believe that that we have a responsibility in the body of Christ, universal, to be accountable. I think that I, sh I, I actually, people get upset with this. I think that if you're sinning on the internet with no accountability and you're abusing people and you're sinning without repentance, I think that your elders should be brought in. Hmm. I think the local church should be involved in that process. If you're sinning on the internet, and I think it's this abusive, unrepentant sin that's just over and over and over again, I think the local church should be involved in that. I have a high view of the church in that regard. Mm -hmm. I think the local elders should be able to be in your life and say, well, what'd you do? And let's talk about that. Was that biblical? And I think that even local elders have to be accountable. Right. So in terms of how um, I would respond to correction, do I like getting a spanking? No. <laughs> But do I know that it is for my good and, and it's for the, the glory of Jesus Christ? Yes. And so you have full right and responsibility to correct me if ever, if ever my foot goes off the path. All right. Oops. I changed programs and there we go. And I think that's at play here. Someone we like, the pastor of our daughter, friend of our son-in-law, hang out, same city, speak with him. I think he's a great guy. Someone we like does something that's kind of stupid or sinful or is done under the auspices of his ministry. We want to defend him personally. What happens is we actually end up defending what it was that he did or deflecting the criticism altogether. And that leads me to the second thing I'm going to talk about. And I addressed, I addressed this topic in a post at Plymouth Report. PNP interviews Michael Markavich regarding the booze and tattoos article. James so White made more, some accusations uh, towards... So there's some more of the, the beer and booze, booze and tattoo article. Sinful and stupid. Um, slightly sinful and stupid, I guess. Yeah, sort of. Or kind of sinful and stupid. Kind of yeah. sinful and stupid. But yeah. that's 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 the explanation of me. And just to make sure people recognize, this was what the meme was. Uh, regard no, who has all the information? Just the people actually inside the church. Was there enough information to be had uh, regarding the beer and tattoo thing in Marcus's video to be able to make a judgment about the video and about what happened that night? The beer and tattoo thing in Marcus's video. Yeah, there was no beer. There was no beer. No. The beer and tattoo thing in Marcus's video. Right. If he wonders where the conflation's coming from. He made it up. Right from your lips, brother. Yep, he did. He did. There's no There's no question about it. Uh, whether he'll admit it or not is, is another issue. Now, as I listened, um, well, here, uh, let, let, let's see if we did this. And it just, it sounds like an attack. Why does, 
That is a doctrinal matter. Those are doctrinal matters. Lifestyle issues are a doctrinal matter. Christian liberty is a doctrinal matter. Yeah. These are doctrinal matters. These are things that should be discussed. They shouldn't be downplayed. We, we shouldn't be so busy talking about... In- okay, now what this was about was my statement to uh, the publisher that if you want to talk about what I'm going to be talking about at the conference, great. If you want to talk about other issues, talk to Jeff Durbin, because he's the one that, that put this on. Right. And he's criticizing me for that. Uh, you should be talking about theology. You should... I really think that if uh, JD was speaking at a conference where someone clearly had an issue with the conference, he'd direct people to the people who are actually putting the conference on too. Uh, at least uh, I think that's wisdom. But it's just I don't I cannot begin to understand why anyone who knows me would take seriously the accusation that I dodge these types of things. <laughs> Most of the criticism I get for the stuff I do on the program is, you know, you talk about this thing and that, the, such a wide, right? And, you know, when you start going after issues of holiness and stuff like that, you know, we get, I, I get criticized for that all the time. I just don't, it, it's hard to even conceive why someone would come up with something like that. There know. are, you can just do a Google search, you'll see people attacking you as uh, preaching a false gospel because you talk about a life of sanctification mm-hmm. and holiness as part and parcel to repentance is not something that's just over there on the side i've debated i debated wilkin on this i mean it's one of the weirdest debates i've ever done but uh i I debated wilkin on this i I, long history of it logical topics that few people can understand and i get their word thank you for doing it and in the meantime though ignore our christian lifestyle and conduct before the world this is the example of having okay no no it's not I don't want to go that far. You've heard the expression, you're of such heavenly mind. How does that phrase go? Now, you see, the reason I chose this one is because there was an example of J.D. pulling himself back. He was about to say, this is the example of being so heavenly mind is no earthly good. Because I said, let's talk about what I was actually be talking about, which is hyper-Calvinism, hoopa-Calvinism, which I sort of think is sort of important, but no one has cared about that because of everything else that's happened. But...